Uh, by the way, my name is John Payne. I'm the pastor of Christ Church Presbyterian in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and, and the convener of the, the Gospel Reformation Network. And uh, we have uh, several uh, distinctives that uh, clearly explain who we are as a, an organization and what we are seeking to, to teach uh, through our articles, through our ministries. Uh, we do have our luncheon coming up, which I assume uh, several of you would be coming to. I think there are 15 or 20 spots left, uh, perhaps, uh, if you are interested in coming. Uh, but very quickly, so we can get to our panel discussion, uh, we are committed uh, to uh, seven, what we have seven couplets of biblical distinctives. The first one is uh, biblical fidelity and confessional integrity. Uh, we have an unyielding commitment to the inspiration, inerrancy, uh, authority, a sufficiency and efficacy of the scriptures for faith and practice and, and a resolute, uh, honest and uh, happy adherence to the Westminster standards. Uh, we believe that our confession of faith is not something to keep up on the shelf, but to, uh, to use, uh, to adhere to, to teach, uh, to use to defend our faith. And we believe that it is important for uh, not only ordination exams, but also for the, the life and ministry of the church. Uh, second, uh, we have uh, an emphasis on gospel-driven and Christ-exalting ministry. Uh, we have a passion to proclaim the gospel. We want the gospel to be the center uh, of all of our, our, our articles and our ministries and uh, a gospel that uh, is clearly communicated. Um, the forensic aspects of the gospel uh, need to be communicated. Uh, the gospel is, is not, um, not us. We are not the gospel. The gospel is is the proclamation of our Lord Jesus Christ and His person and work. And we believe that person and work should be clearly communicated in preaching, teaching, uh, and so on. Uh, but also a Christ-exalting ministry. That is that uh, the fruit of the gospel is a love for Christ, the desire to walk with Him and to know Him and have deep affection uh, for Him. Uh, we love the Puritan's emphasis, uh, Samuel Rutherford's emphasis on the loveliness of Christ and having a passion to know Him and to walk with him, that our piety, the center of our piety, would be the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, uh, thirdly, earnest prayer and expository preaching, uh, a resolve to practice fervent prayer in the closet and from the pulpit, uh, along with an unbending dedication to expository preaching that informs the mind, transforms the heart, and stirs the affections. Uh, we, we believe in this. Uh, we believe our worship services should be constituted of, of substantial a prayer. We believe that pastors shouldn't only be praying in their pulpits, but also uh, in their closets. Uh, we believe in, in true uh, God-centered piety. Fourthly, intentional evangelism and personal uh, discipleship. Uh, this is a purposeful commitment to bold evangelism. Uh, that is evangelism which clearly communicates a truth. Uh, that we, we don't want to be forever doing pre-evangelism. Uh, we want to do evangelism. Uh, that which clearly uh, communicates uh, the person and work of Christ and repentance. Um, uh, and then personal discipleship, uh, that is a dedication to the old paths of serious, deliberate, faith-maturing discipleship. Uh, the Apostle Paul, as he describes uh, the ministry of the apostles in Colossians 1, says that his, their goal for which he toils and labors is to make, what? Mature disciples. And so that is uh, what we want to to encourage in our denomination. Fifthly, godly leadership in Presbyterian polity. Um, we believe that there needs to be a, a sincere devotion to personal piety among church leadership. We think there needs to be a, a reinforcing of this um, in our seminaries and uh, through our preaching and our, our writing. Uh, pastors are Christians first uh, and then pastors. Sheep first and then shepherds. Amen. We need to walk with Jesus ourselves before we seek to teach others to do the same. And so we want to encourage that. Uh, coupled also with a strong adherence to biblical Presbyterianism. We, we believe in Presbyterianism. We believe it's, it's uh, it, we don't do it perfectly, but we believe it's biblical. Uh, reformed worship and vibrant community. We, we have a, a, a joyful commitment to and a humble confidence in the ordinary means of grace in Lord's Day worship. Uh, we believe this is the center of of, of discipleship and, 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 and Christian piety, reformed worship, and then vibrant community, which flows out of, of that um, reformed worship. And finally, missional clarity and church multiplication. A fervent and undistracted commitment to make disciples of all nations through the preaching of the gospel 
and the planting and strengthening of biblical churches. So we, we want to encourage this, a real clarity in our mission, uh, as well as church multiplication in the states and around uh, the world. And so uh, with that, I do want to um, bring us to our, our time of uh, questions um, for our um, for our panel, and uh, many of you will uh, know uh, members of our panel, uh, Dr. Dave uh, Garner from Westminster uh, Seminary, Philadelphia, uh, Doc- <laughs> Dr. Joel Kim, who is the new president of Westminster West. Uh, we are so thankful to have Joel also speaking uh, at our, our conference, uh, Dr. David Strain. Uh, who is the Senior Minister of First Presbyterian Church in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, Jason, Reverend Jason Halopoulos, who is the uh, new minister at University Reformed in East Lansing, Michigan, and Dr. Richard D. Phillips, uh, who is the pastor of Second Presbyterian Church in Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, it's wonderful to have you guys here with us, and I know we're, we're all excited to hear uh, some of your thoughts. And Harry was supposed to be with us today. Has anybody heard from Harry? Anybody know where Harry is? Okay. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. I had a real zinger for Harry to begin us off, but uh, uh, we'll start. You can still do it. Yes, we can still do it. Um, I'm actually going to direct this um, to the two uh, Westminster guys on, on the opposite ends of, of, of the country. Uh, what do you see as some trends uh, within the students that you're receiving? We're all concerned about uh, the future of Presbyterianism, the future of warm-hearted, reformed confessionalism, and of course you guys are, are, are leaders within seminaries that are producing the future uh, men and ministers uh, for the PCA and other reformed denominations. What trends uh, do you see happening where you are encouraged by, and what trends do you see that perhaps you are uh, concerned about? And I'll uh, maybe begin with Joel. Well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity for me to join you. This is a distinct uh, group of uh, company of pastors here, delighted to be here and representing the school, as well as uh, many of the pastors that are in California. Who It's a difficult trek for them to get here for the GA, but we're delighted to be here as well. It's a difficult question because there are so many factors that we're dealing with, but there are a few distinct um, notions that I think we can talk about. One of the issues that we see is as a, as a person who lives in the... Um, in California, which is a bellwether state, we recognize that it's not a state that's Christianized in general, which means that many of our students, Westminster Seminary in uh, California in particular, now about 50% of the students incoming every year are coming not from Reformed uh, uh, churches or confessional churches, but non-Reformed or confessional churches. These are folks that as they go out, oftentimes they're encountering unchurched, de-churched, anti-church folks on a regular basis around the corner of your homes. And many of the students are coming in with this kind of mindset, having never encountered Reformed theology in its totality on a regular basis. What that means is many of them have not had the kind of confessional training that one would normally expect, especially in the history of seminary education, coming into it with a growth as well as systematic understanding of larger doctrinal issues is one factor that we see. But the second part of that we also see is they really have a very minimal understanding of the Bible. It's true that in many of our seminary education, I I don't think we are alone in this, many of the students who come in, not only do they not have theological understanding, they also don't have Bible understanding. Uh, Many of them, as they come in, you recognize that we're starting at the level of educating and training them in the large full or picture of Christ in all of scriptures, helping them see from Genesis to Revelation where Christ is seen and found. That also is coupled with the overall decline in educational level of the students coming in, the simple issue of reading and writing, uh, of being able to train them at the remedial level in order for them to rise to the level of doing uh, theological education is a very important one. And when seminaries trend toward decreasing their units in order to meet both the financial and enrollment challenges, I think it goes against not only where both Westminster stand, I don't think it's helpful in this tumultuous changing times to educate pastors less 
when what we need is educating the pastors more. If there's one positive thing, if I may mention, with the younger generation coming up, is that they are incredibly globally minded, globally connected, globally minded. And that global consciousness is, I think, a huge positive. They don't see their outworking of their faith as simply in the local church, although as worthy and honorable as that is. They see themselves potentially considering and thinking about engaging, engaging beyond the borders of this country in terms of their overall ministry. And in, from my vantage point, I think that's a huge positive of the generation coming up. Thanks, Joel. Very good comments, which I would just give a round of, of seconds to. I'll just add a couple of things briefly. First of all, it is my experience with pastors in our nation that there's a growing sense of discouragement about the church. And I think one of the privileges that we have at our respective institutions and others like ours is that we actually get to see firsthand the next generation of church leaders. And it's a sweet privilege, honestly, to see young people motivated to serve the Lord Jesus Christ faithfully and to have an opportunity to bear an imprint on their hearts and minds and preparing them for gospel ministry. So I, in some ways, I just want to encourage you that the Lord Jesus is still alive and well Amen. and that the, the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. And we just at seminary level have a wonderful opportunity to be exposed to that. So I'm just encouraged that the Lord continues to bring us students who are longing to serve the Lord Jesus faithfully. Secondly, and maybe on the, the concern side, I would echo what Joel has said. I might add that there is an effect of what we would call in theological circles and seminaries of the reader-centered hermeneutic uh, in which the world of truth revolves around me. Now, many of our students would not self-consciously approach a text thinking that its truth resides in the way in which they feel or think. But the effects of that culturally actually have gripped this generation in, un in ways that they are not even aware. And in my two decades plus of teaching, I have seen that increasingly um, in ways that I think is concerning. And so our task, as Joel has articulated, in some ways is more difficult now than it ever has been. Just one illustration of that. We in, at Westminster in Philly do an assignment in some of our courses of what we call digesting. And digesting is not a journal or reflection on a text. It is actually a summation of what the text says. And teaching our students to first read what the text says as opposed to what they feel or what it means to them is a critical pedagogical step. So pray for our students to actually be faithful to read not only Scripture, but also to read everything that they're reading and understand it before they move to concerns of application and implication. Next question will be for Rick Phillips. By the way, we had some questions that were sent in to us. Uh, some of them are represented here. Uh, Rick, what do you say to a young uh, man who's uh, an ordinance who's coming into the PCA and you want to give him an exhortation for his future ministry. Uh, in light of the times, what do you say to him? I'm sure there are many here today who are in that. Yeah. Of, well, first, I want to briefly piggyback on Joel. And I do think that we're living in times where the value of an outstanding education is, is significant. If you look at people in church history who've really had a big impact, uh, you think of, of John Wycliffe, you think of John Huss, uh, Wycliffe was the number one scholar at Oxford. You kind of think of him as this wild, well, no, no, no. He was the leading scholar of England. Jan Haas was the leading scholar in, in, in uh, Czechoslovakia. And I always want to urge people, I know that some people, for economic reasons, are kind of minimizing the seminary, want to get into the pulpit as soon as possible. Uh, let's, at least, uh, as much as possible, a residency, full MDiv program, and I think even beyond that is very valuable. I think that the intellectual chaos of our times means that it's more likely that better educated ministers are going to have a bigger impact. Now, as young people come into the PCA, uh, I think there's a great reason to be encouraged. 
um, uh, about, about the PCA. I mean, I suppose the PCA has simultaneously never been more progressive and never been more reformed than it is right at this moment. <laughs> and um, but I, I think that the uh, I, I tend to talk to people who the reason they come and talk to me is not to get up with the trends, uh, but uh, because they have confessional concerns. Uh, this is a great gathering, and and I see a. I would argue that in the PCA, the conservative wing, whatever that is has maybe never been healthier than it is right now. And I, I'm holding in, I, the, my prize of the day is John Payne just gave me, and it blesses my heart, uh, the fifth anniversary coffee mug for Christ Church Presbyterian in Charleston, which uh, our church was able to, and I had, was able to play a role in. And, uh, you know, we're not primarily about polemics. We're primarily about the, the, the kingdom work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're planting churches. And so uh, the whole idea that, you know, it's kind of nice to have these confessionally reformed convictions, but if you want to be doing things for Jesus, if you want to be church planting, you've got to go a different route. I don't think that's a conclusion young people should draw at all. And we're marshalling resources, and we've got, I think that the John's church planter, the one he serves, has been an enormous encouragement. And our churches are growing. I see... Uh, I, I'm, I'm located in a certain region, so I'm in South Carolina. So in the southeast, South Carolina is chock full of conservative, confessional churches that are thriving. So is Georgia. So is Alabama. So is Mississippi. Uh, I don't. Does anything thrive in Tennessee? I'm not, <laughs> I, 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 I just asked for it. Yeah, yeah hey, amen. There we go, Brian. There we go. Yeah, that's right. But that's what we're about, with a little humor thrown in. Uh, uh, and uh, let's not be about what we're against. Now, you always have to do polemics, but let's minor in that. We do that as our duty lies. But if you're a young person, if you're going, oh, I have PCA, that's not a place for a guy with historic reform. No, it is the place. And I think it's a vibrant community of folks, and uh, we're trying to have a positive, both personally and corporately relations with those who might have a different perspective from us. But um, you can plant a confessional church in the PCA today, and there's a community that's excited about you. And, and we'll, Obviously, when we raise money to plant churches, we plant churches we like, you know, and we believe what we believe, and uh, John's church plants like that. But it's, uh, we, we need young people coming out of our seminaries who, who have strong historic, and I don't mind saying conservative, uh, 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 confessional commitments, the PCA is a great place for you. And, and there's always some dynamic on that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm in a presbytery that has a pretty, we probably have all PCA groups reflected. We get along fine, and, and I feel great about what's going on. And so uh, uh, I do hear, and I think this is behind John's question, People saying, oh, you know, I'm really confessional. I can't go into the PCA. That is, come into the PCA. And there's a great community of folks, and we have good relationships on a broader basis with people who might be a little different. So I hope that's encouraging. Yes, thanks, Rick. So related to that, I'll I'll direct this uh, first to David Strain, then to Jason. Uh, David and Jason, um, who, for me, have modeled a kind of uh, warm-hearted, positive relationship Reformed and Presbyterian confessionalism. It's important as things come up, like the Revoice Conference, which you know has caused concern in our hearts, and and other uh, things as they emerge, and we're we're concerned. It's important that our tone uh, is not one of of harshness or anger or unnecessarily alarmist. Uh, you two have modeled for me uh, a, a a measured response and wanting to engage in a way that is, that is godly. And, and, and so help all of us in the room to understand better how to engage with those with whom we differ, for whom Christ died, but with whom we differ. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I, I think there are a number of things that, that, that come to mind. One is we do have to be sure we represent people with whom we disagree in a way that they themselves will recognize. Um, I think there's been a great deal of damage done by concerned, uh, well-meaning brothers and sisters who, with whom I would, I would share a great deal of common ground convictionally, 
but but who have have been the sort of of the ready fire aim school of of, uh, <laughs> of churchmanship and and that's just so unhelpful when when conservative voices come over as angry and defensive when they're tilting at windmills you know when they're when they see legitimate cause for concern when two and two when two and two equal four and four is bad enough we don't have to talk about six you know two and two do not make six and when when people write and speak about mm. some exaggerated uh um problem down the line that may never be there that no one's actually saying and no one's actually advocating for when what, they're, what they are in fact advocating for is already problematic enough we really don't have to overstate things in order to win, win an argument so let's be measured let's understand those with whom we disagree let's do it with as much charity as we can exercise let's, let's ask them is this a fair reflection of what you think am I do you recognize yourself in this discussion? I think that's a very useful, very humble, transparent way of, of doing things. Um, I, I also think it's good if you have someone um, that you are engaged with um, and you're, you're, you've got some substantive disagreements. If that person only exists online, you might want to not say anything online. You know, if it's a real person and you're actually having genuine conversation, uh, if you're talking to them, and so you you have a genuine, honest to goodness, real pulse involved. You know, there's a heart beating at the other end of that email account that you're and you're asking these sorts of questions there. So that when if you write something or you speak somewhere, um, it, you have a relationship in mind that means something to you, that, that you care about. And so even if you are strongly engaging with someone who's an opponent, you still want to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Mm -hmm. I think it's important on that score also to remember we're talking about brothers. There, I do not believe there are liberals in the PCA. I, let's not ever use that word. I, I came from the Church of Scotland. Um, and I know what a liberal looks like, and I haven't seen any of them around here. Um, I was the only evangelical, maybe one other, amongst the students or faculty at Trinity College in Glasgow when I trained for the ministry. My Old Testament professor was an atheist, um, and the opening class involved him inviting people to put their hand up if they believed in various uh, evangelical, standard evangelical positions like a do you believe in a, a global flood? Do you believe in uh, that God made all things out of nothing? Put your hand up. And he had everyone turn and stare and say, look at that Neanderthal in the back that believes these ridiculous ideas. Uh, that's liberalism. Uh, we don't have any of those. We, we do have people who, often driven by genuine pastoral concern, you mentioned the Revoice Conference, genuine pastoral concern for folks who are struggling with same-sex attraction and are locked in sin, striving to find a, a healthy, uh, effective pastoral response. And I, I just think that they have they've landed in the wrong place. I think that they have they have minimized um, some of the, the fundamental uh, biblical and confessional teaching on the nature of sin and how it penetrates right to the roots of our personhood so that, so that the bias towards sin is sin itself. That's a, that's a theological disagreement. But I'm not aware of anyone in the PCA who says that, that homosexual sex is acceptable. I'm not aware of anyone in the PCA who says um, that homosexual lust is acceptable. And so we, we, we've got to We've got to characterize those with whom we differ fairly, lovingly, wisely, winsomely. And then once we've really crystallized where the points of disagreement are, let's roll up our sleeves and really go for it and be clear. And uh, let's do exegesis. Let's do the historical, theological, and the, the confessional spade work to make the case. Let's not have so much heat. Let's have a bit more light. I think that's what we really need.
And the goal the goal is speaking the truth in love. I heard recently someone uh, said uh, clarity with charity. Clarity with charity. We all know when we are or are not speaking the truth with love. And that's the goal always. And with that right, I mean, as we are, uh, I mean, as Christian pastors, as Christian elders, uh, I want to safeguard my own heart as I'm pursuing these things. And I want to be pursuing Christ and focusing upon Christ and growing in the likeness of Christ. And I think that requires of us that we give charity to our brothers uh, and that we look uh, at them with love and that we give the benefit of the doubt with those that we disagree with. Uh, you know, One of the beauties to me of, of our Presbyterianism, of confessional Presbyterianism, is that one, we stand upon conviction. So we say, look, this is what we believe. Uh, we are true to the Scriptures, true to the Reformed faith, obedient to the Great Commission. Love our slogan as a denomination. Uh, we stand upon our convictions. And yet also within Presbyterianism, right, there, there, is, there is a sense of compromise as we're Presbyterians. Uh, there is a, a give and a take built within our polity. Uh, because we govern together as elders. And uh, to me, that is part of the beauty of the system. Uh, because uh, I'm not right about everything. And I have my own sinful tendencies. And so I need men that are pulling me in different directions on different things. And that are speaking into my life in different ways. Uh, and I think sometimes uh, we can have the tendency... Uh, I think this is true whether it's theology or politics or whatever, uh, that conservative people can feel like if there's anybody to the right of me, we get a little nervous, like I haven't gone right enough. And if there's anybody to the left of me, they're just crazy. Uh, and I think part of the beauty of Presbyterianism is that we're, we're pulling each other a little bit. And there's this natural tension that is built into our system. And I think that's healthy. And I think that's good for our souls. And uh, instead of mischaracterizing men, and uh, instead of responding uh, with a animosity, uh, mm. it's looking and saying, what, where is it that I need to learn here and need to be taught while I'm standing firmly upon my convictions, what I'm convinced of by Scripture? And, you know, what, what are ways that the Lord is gently nudging me and tugging me in different ways? And I think that helps us to have a winsome spirit. Please. One of the things I think I struggle with, maybe we all struggle with who self-identify uh, as confessional, um, is, is um, preaching to the choir. Uh, instead of really engaging with those with whom we differ, we sound like we're engaging with those with whom we differ, but I'm really, I'm really sort of vir virtue signaling to my tribe that I'm, I'm one of you guys, and you can trust me, and, and we're all on the same team. And maybe there's a place for that somewhere, but I, I'm not sure that it really advances anything and helps us. It certainly doesn't help us understand one another, get to the root of the matter. Let's not virtue signal. Let's not preach to the choir. Let's really try to... Let's really try... To, to identify what are the issues and, and, and let's, let's roll up our sleeves and do the hard work of talking about where are the fault lines, how deep do they really run, can they be mended, and if they can, let's try. And if they can't, now what? Too much smoke and heat, not enough light. Let's, let's not preach to the choir. And there have been questions that have come in, of course, dealing with what, when is it time, how far is too far, what lines are crossed that we cannot cross, and uh, those are all great questions. I just think that we are in agreement as a council that we are not there yet. We're not there yet to have meetings about forming the next denomination and these kinds of things. Uh, we believe that is off in the distance if it's to be there at all. We pray it never is. Uh, we, we, our prayer, really, our sincere prayer, is that there would be a confessional integrity within our denomination so that those who realize that they are out of accord with the confession and no longer hold to our, 
our polity, our constitution, that they would say, you know, I think I'd, I would serve better elsewhere. And that's our prayer for the peace and purity of the church. Um, and, and through it all, we want to, 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 to engage uh, with um, humility and with a good conscience so that whatever happens, we're not embarrassed by the way we've behaved in the midst of what might be in the future a theological fight. We don't know. Uh, but we want to honor the Lord in it all. On that uh, point, uh, Dave, you've done a lot of work in missions. Um, Dave Garner has done a lot of work in, in missions and the mission of the church. And that's one of the biggest questions, I think, facing the PCA today. And I think we're all in agreement on that, is that what is the mission of the church? We, we hear a lot about word and deed ministry. Uh, some people have said, you know, word and deed ministry can turn into deed and word ministry, which then turns into deed ministry. And that's the, the social justice sort of progression that we've seen in denominations in the past. What is the mission of the church, Dave, and how can we guard against a kind of overstepping on, on not wanting to be involved in our communities at all, salt and light ministry and, and, and good deeds and so forth, um, and then, or, or then going the other direction of just being caught up in the social justice, social action side of things? Yeah, boy, complicated set of issues and questions. I, one of, I think maybe on the long lines of what David Strain was just talking about in terms of, of creating straw men, um, that's one of the dangers in this discussion about the mission of the church and how do word and deed fit together. If I could just create maybe a, a bit of an image for us briefly. You know, there are some that so, uh, if you, you could see on, on the one hand, a, a, a notion of word-centeredness that would be to the neglect of deed. If you could imagine it this way, like somebody bringing a megaphone to the corridor of a hospital and just declaring, declaring, declaring and ignoring the real physical needs for mercy and bandages. Um, that's not a biblical notion of word-centered ministry. Uh, on the other hand, there is a, a, and I appreciate the zeal often by those who want to say, we want to make a difference, we want to make an impact, we want to change the culture and society around us. I think the question, again, if I can absolutize that for just a minute, and I want you just to, you know, to envision the, the idea that uh, much of that zeal is driven by a genuine compassion for people who are suffering. Now, I, let me just put this in some pretty bold terms. I actually believe an unsanctified compassion is one of the greatest enemies of faithful gospel ministry. And what I mean by that is that when we allow our human emotion to shape the way in which we move towards concern and do not have that heart shaped by a biblical ethic, and that our, our task in the church is to be on the divine errand of mercy, which is to present Christ before people, to declare him to, and to proclaim him, then every deed ministry needs to be driven by a concern for presenting Christ. And that is not only in our deeds, it must be with our words. Now, what do you do in a hospital corridor? Well, you don't use a megaphone. You go to the bedside and seek to care for those who are wounded and hurting. You bandage their wounds. And you do so openly declaring the name of Christ. And so I would want to argue that the mission of the church, clearly, our authority is ministerial and declarative. It is a word-centered ministry. But we need not allow our fear of some sort of Radical transformationalism will lead us to another extreme where we become so marginalized and isolated that we think that we have no responsibility to care for others. Now, I realize there's all sorts of nuance that needs to be addressed in that. But to whatever degree we're thinking about mercy only, divorce from word, or a word-centered ministry that is not concerned for the hearts and, and physical, emotional, and mental, uh, mental, spiritual needs of others, we are not carrying out a faithful biblical ministry. One of the questions, Dave, as you know, is, is it the mission of the church to eradicate world poverty mm -hmm. and to sure. fight the sex trade and, and all of these things where this is where the real discussion gets kind of it does get sticky, right? Yeah, sure. um, 
How are we to respond to that? What are we yeah. to be doing? Well, that? so, again, the desire to address those things, I think, filtered through a, a notion of the primacy of the exaltation of Christ Jesus. There's value there. But what ends up happening often, John, I think, is that that becomes in itself the mission of the church in people's minds so that we've actually carried out our mission when we've addressed those political, social justice sorts of needs. And so I would simply want to say that if our task is to exalt Christ, what we lead with in a particular moment, it might be a deed ministry that we lead with. But if we're doing that deed ministry in any way that is disconnected from the church and from the proclamation of the word, we've lost our way missionally, I believe. Yes, yes. And so I'm not saying neglect the sex trade. I'm saying when the mission of our local church or our denomination becomes addressing the sex trade, we've actually lost our way yes. in terms of the biblical mandate. Amen. Rick? Yes. Yeah, I, I think that... I, just, uh, I think a distinction that's coming out what you're saying is we, the work of the gospel... Look, the mission of the church is given by the Lord of the church. The Lord of the church is the Lord Jesus. The Great Commission is the mission of the church. Uh, my church is going through a mission process, and we didn't start by asking what our mission is. We started by taking the mission that's been given to us, which is the Great Commission. And so it's one thing, and it's a vital thing, that we're doing deed ministry, we're doing mercy as part of the work of the gospel. The, the, in terms of the goal, the end, that's the work of the gospel, the building of the church. And there'll be mercy in it. But the whole idea that the church is responsible for social outcomes in and of themselves, I think we're agreed is unbiblical. And it is, not the, it is not the mission, it is not the mandate, it is not the charter of the church to labor to produce secular ends, however beneficial they may be. And so people will say, well, you Christians, I mean, all the good deeds you're doing, you're just doing it for the sake of the gospel. Amen? We are. But take out the just. I, I, I briefly, uh, they asked John Piper at the last Luzon uh, conference to speak on mercy ministry, and I, I've heard that there was a, uh, a uh, social gospel vibe going, and they, uh, Piper says, I agree to speak on mercy ministry under two conditions, that I can emphasize the most pronounced suffering and the longest enduring suffering. And the most, most pronounced suffering is God's wrath in hell, and the longest suffering is eternity. Therefore, the gospel is the chief mercy ministry. And I, I think it's important while we're emphasizing doing deeds work as a part of the gospel that social political outcomes are not the mission of the church. I think that needs to be said with as much clarity as what you're saying is that we don't want to neglect deeds. Amen. Thank you. Harry, we're so glad uh, that you could join us. The way Harry reads. Yes. Um, would love to ask you uh, a question. We were talking last, yesterday over coffee, and you were expressing... Um, your desire, you've been in the PCA for, for uh, several decades and you've seen it from the beginning and you see where it is now. What, uh, what en encouragement, what exhortation would you give us in terms of, you know, as you were sharing yesterday, getting back to the basics? Well, um, first of all, uh, I want to apologize for being late. There's, um, there's two things that probably uh, are the most futile things you ever do in your life. Uh, one is uh, however much time you take to think of the name of your cat. And, uh, <laughs> and then secondly, uh, whatever expenditure you make to give somebody over 60 a, a technological device. Uh, that's, those are two pretty futile things. So uh, I am sorry that I am here. Uh, What's your cat's name? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the worst stewardship of your life if you if you actually own a cat. But uh, <laughs> there, there there will be no, you are not you know you think you're your cat's master actually you're on your cat's staff is what yeah. you are. Yeah. And there won't be cats in heaven. Uh, Amen. Yeah. Wouldn't be hell without cats. Yeah, you know. You don't see, at Halloween, you don't see a dog next to a witch, I can tell you that. Um, so, um, 
So anyway, thanks for your patience. Uh, what John has said is something that's very dear to my heart, uh, and I confess uh, it's always been. Um, my background was I was a Reformed Baptist and greatly uh, thankful for all that I learned. One of my key mentors is uh, now in almost 80 and uh, one of the greatest preachers I've ever heard. But one of the things, other than some, the theological convictions around the sacraments, the law of God, and... Um, uh, and the doctrine of the church that brought me into Presbyterianism was I was greatly drawn to the PCA when it came time to make my choice. In fact, it wasn't even a toss-up for me because I finally found a place I felt where I could where I could unabashedly embrace uh, the depth and uh, the depth and and uh, impact of Reformed theology with the breadth of a of an evangelical heart to fulfill the great commission and leave the and live the great commandment uh with a great commitment and um so i uh i was drawn here um and and so uh, so grateful i loved coming to general assemblies uh loved our presbytery i was in south florida at the time and um i was was grateful for it and i look back on it and one of the simple things well, some of the things were just the simple things that were, uh, there was a, uh, we would meet for prayer for the lost. We would meet for prayer for church planting. We would meet for prayer um, to uphold one another when we would assemble together. There was, uh, uh, I'll never forget one of our general assemblies where Dr. Kennedy gave the moderator sermon, outgoing moderator sermon, and it contained seven people. As not, It was no self Exaltation. It was just seven people that he, six, I'm sorry, six people that he had actually led to Christ since he landed uh, at the airport uh, that day. And I would, he couldn't even say anything else in the sermon. I was convicted uh, because uh, at that point, and uh, um, just that the heart for the Great Commission and all of its dynamics uh, and, the, um, and, the, and what drew us together to fulfill that. Uh, and it wasn't the the ten percent on the side; it was the eighty percent in the middle that drove us together around those two things. Uh, the simplicity of desiring to live a holy life, recognizing our utter dependence upon the power of the Holy Spirit and the grace of God. The simplicity of let's let's promote personal evangelism and let's promote expository preaching that equips and evangelizes. Uh, let's um, let's make full use of a functional Presbyterianism, of uh, banding together as brothers in the Lord and leading the Church of Christ as fathers and brothers. And I would say those are the things that, uh, in all of my uh, uh, in all in my heart, as I advance down the timeline of life, that I remember. Now, part of it is. Let me confess. I I grew up. Uh, my grandfather was on the original Billy Graham team. And um, and I would have many discussions with people on the Graham team about theology, but one thing I always admired was the single-mindedness to uh, to proclaim the gospel and try to be consistent in life and uh, and in action uh, by the agency. And that simplicity has always uh, has always. And I watched the camaraderie of the Graham team around the Great Commission. Uh, these guys were joined together uh, with that, very different fellows, and I would listen to the discussions from a Cliff Barris to a George Beverly Shea to uh, Billy and, um, and others, and, uh, and that, that while, I was not, while my theological antenna wa was up, I, 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 I loved to see that, and I would, that's something I long for um, constantly. And so, John, I, I was greatly blessed by your uh, blog on mere Presbyterianism because I thought it struck all of those chords, and I was grateful for it. Thank you. Anybody else want to, to answer that question? Trends that they're seeing that, uh, that they're concerned about, what we hope we get back to as a, as a denomination? I think one of the um, concerns that, John, you and I share is the concern for the kind of piety within the church and the, the growth in terms of one's maturity in the faith. 
When I started my ministry and I got ordained in 2001, one senior pastor told me that there are three G's to avoid. Gold, glory, and girls is what he told me. <laughs> After some time, when I told this story to someone else, they added a fourth G, which was golf. But I'm not sure <laughs> if that qualifies for... I'm not... <laughs> just, just to add to that as well. There is a... T- we, we've seen many uh, among my peers, those ahead of me as well as behind me, who've disqualified themselves from ministry for various reasons recently. Perhaps it's more frequent, perhaps we're more known, simply because of the information that flows. But it it is a concern for many of us as well. And I think there are a couple of things that we do see among our young folks, including my generation as well, that there is a confusion between giftedness and godliness, that somehow if you're gifted, that also means you're godly. But that's untrue. Uh, You can hide behind the veil of giftedness and somehow make yourselves believe that that's godliness, but that there, there, there's a concern if that's long kept, uh, that one begins to separate those two things and think that it's still acceptable and okay. I think another concern that we see among seminarians and young pastors is that thinking that somehow busyness also equals blessedness. Uh, we've never seen schedules so full Everyone Mm. talking about how busy they are in ministry. And there's a confusion in thinking that somehow busyness means that the Lord has blessed the work that we're doing. I'm not exactly sure if that's a scriptural perspective, that oftentimes simply sitting before the Lord in silence and recognizing that he is our Lord is just as important as writing that next blog, writing that next book, or raising the church and being engaged somewhere. And I do think that somehow restoring and recovering the kind of balance between theological fidelity and personal piety Mm. is an important one. And for seminaries like us, we exist for the churches, not the the other way around. And it's a partnership we depend on. That is, while we can help the students understand things better and the faculty members help model what it means to live for Christ on a day-to-day basis, But we depend upon churches and the families and the session as well as the pastors to nurture and shape these men into ministers uh, for the future work that they're engaged in. And so we are continuing to pray for, grateful for the churches as we engage in this um, uh, issue as well as this matter before the Lord. To piggyback on that, I think that in many respects we're in a Corinthian moment in the church where uh, charisma, where giftedness is valued more than character. And I want to speak to the ruling elders here and the search committee members. One of the big things that's really hurting us is how we define success. How we define success is virtually everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, I think we've we've been accurately critiqued in some respect. We'll say success is faithfulness. Well, faithfulness includes the gospel zeal. Faithfulness is not just not going liberal. Faithfulness includes a missional drive. But properly, uh, you know, constructed faithfulness is what we're aspiring to. But, uh, you know, a young guy with gifts and a shining personality will often be elevated in in years before he's ready because he's got an attractive personality and good speaking abilities. Whereas somebody who's got a tremendous Christian character, and, and maybe he's less gifted, I mean, he's a competent, um, will often not be valued. And it speaks to, we're, we're very much like the Corinthian church. We, we are knowledge worshiping in, in, in a somewhat wrong way. Mm. And this obsession with giftedness, with the charisms over character. And one of the biggest corrections we can make both in our own lives, the cultivation of piety, but also, you know, the ministers are reflecting the expectations, too, because, you know, you kind of get worn down and you, 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 you do want to be uh, doing what, what's being asked of you by your elders. Uh, uh, expecting and valuing and prizing godly character and the growth of that does not have much emphasis among us. And to that extent, we are like that Corinthian church that was so criticized for just these things by Paul. We, we are almost uh, done here. And Dave, quick thing, and then Harry will have the last word. 
just to piggyback on what Rick said there, I think it actually it relates very much to the mission of the church question. Many of the reasons why we are compelled by so many of these social justice issues is because the, the world is defining what's important. And we think that if we're going to be important, we have to be about what the world says is important. And that ties directly to what you're saying about the mission of the church is defined by the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. the head of the church. We are to listen to him and to prioritize what he has prioritized. That was exactly what I was going to say. And, uh, <laughs> but to affirm my, my dear brother's uh, affirmation, I think it, it doesn't take long to look at First Timothy 3. And when you list out the 17 qualifications, there is a definitely order. To, there's an order to them. And the fact is, is that 15 of them deal with character and conduct. Only two deal with competency. And uh, I don't think that means giftedness is not important. It just means godliness is more important than giftedness. Uh, the second thing uh, that I would say is, it, it, here's the way my congregation is probably so tired of hearing me say this, but uh, we have got to ask the Spirit of God to enable us to effectively and faithfully be on mission, on message, and in ministry. It's this, those three simple things. And we have to understand is that mission will eventually define your message. Whatever you determine the mission is for the church, eventually, I used to think it was the other way around. I don't any longer. Whatever you, if, if, if it becomes social justice and uh, cultural transformation or, 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 or self-esteem, if any of those things, if we think that's our mission, then the self-esteem will end up with the therapy gospel, the cultural thing will end up with the prosperity gospel, uh, or we'll end up with a social gospel. Uh, that's what we'll end up with, is that mission will ultimately define the message. So we've got to stay, number one, on mission, number two, on message, and then number three, in the ministry, the ministry of worship, evangelism, discipleship, fellowship, those ministries that God has ordained for us. And that's what, that's what we're here to do. And that's what I believe God has called us to do. I also would just put out one other word, and that is this. Over years of observation, not only will the mission ultimately define your message <clears throat> over a period of time, but the other thing to watch out for is we are in the world but not of the world. This issue of contextualization, and I'll just simply put it this way because we're out of time, is... It, it is a valid thing to desire to contextualize, meaning I want to speak in terms that the world understands. But what is invalid is contextualization becoming I will only speak on the terms the world demands. And I think that's what we have to avoid. It is amazing how we tend to move toward what the world affirms, and we avoid being clear on what the world um, on what the world despises that we deal with. And uh, so I think let's let's take great pains to speak in terms that the world understands in faithfulness to the scripture. But we are not going to submit to speaking only on the terms that the world accepts. Thank you, Harry. Well, I'm so glad that you could be with us today. Um, I hope this has given you a little taste of the Gospel Reformation Network. If you want to learn more, go to our website, gospelreformation.net. And if I can ask David Strain, please close us in prayer. Let's pray. God, our Father, we praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ, the King and Head of the Church, who is building his church so that the gates of hell shall not and are not prevailing against it. We thank you for the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe mm. and that you have entrusted to us such riches. We ask for one another and for our beloved denomination. Grant to us grace, O Lord, that we may love your word that your word may begin to bear such fruit in our lives that each of us individually, the churches that we represent and the denomination that we love, may come more and more closely to resemble the Savior whose 
name we proclaim. Lord, we long to see men and women, boys and girls, across our country and around the world, bend the knee to Christ. And so we pray that you would rend the heavens and come down. Pour out your spirit afresh upon the word of God proclaimed and upon your people. That you might make use of us, all our sin notwithstanding. To bring uh, an, a, an awakening that there might be revival in our day. That we long for it. We pray, Father, for the deliberations of our fathers and brothers. In the the days ahead of us, we ask, please, would you grant to us wisdom and charity, patience and forbearance. Help us to stand and to contend earnestly for the truth, but always to temper our contentions for truth with tenderness, that we may indeed maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We pray that you would break our hearts over the divisions that continue to divide us and uh, strain at the, the bonds of our fellowship. We ask that you would lead us to greater clarity and consensus around things that matter most. Mm. You would teach us to love the gospel with new fervency and become renewed in our passion to see the world brought to bend the knee to Christ. So hear us as we cry out to you. Grant mercy to us and to our denomination for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen.